Hello. Okay. Today we have four experts by experience sharing their stories. It's really, really hard to ask somebody to share a story in 10 minutes. So <laughs> it's kind of like a condensed version of what they would like. And we've asked them to focus on what helped, what harmed, and any recommendations they have for the future. I'm going to ask them each to introduce themselves so I don't take up more time because we're already running late. So the first person we have is virtual, and his name is Joshua Roberts from San Diego. Thank you, Josh. There I am. I've popped up on the screen. Uh, I really value your attention. I don't take it lightly at all. And I really value ISPS US for listening to the voices of lived experience, because I think that there is indeed opportunity through experience. And I think there can be a beautiful synergy between the world of academic mental health and this peer support perspective. It's kind of like if you're going to go to South Africa for the first time, which is where I'm from, uh, you could read all about it in a textbook. You would know so much about its history and its contours. But only if you've lived there can you know the smell as the sun is coming up or the unique cacophony of the bird sounds. And yet the people who read the textbook would know things that the locals don't and vice versa. So I just really appreciate the emphasis on the lived experience. And so we're going to talk about what my lived experience was like and what set me apart. I'm going to try to combine like left brain logic with a little bit of right brain flow here. And so I'll do it in five sections um, and I'll just flow in those sections. The first one will be kind of what happened. The second one will be what I learned and how my perspectives changed over time. And then in the third section, we'll talk about the impact that the diagnosis had on me. In the fourth, I'll share about the interventions that both helped and hindered and in the fifth section, my little vision about how we could transform the mental health field and actually broader society at large. Are you ready to roll? Let's roll. This is going to be fun. Firstly, my experience, who on earth are you? Why do you sound so peculiar? Joshua Roberts, born and raised in Cape Town, South Africa. And I traveled the world for about 10 years after graduating high school, but nowhere was more interesting than the deep and mysterious terrain of my own mind the human mind and my experiences are reflections of the possibilities of your own consciousness and so i took two little peeks down alice's rabbit hole on my world travels until i awakened the dormant potential that i inherited of mental health conditions from both sides of my family there was schizophrenia and bipolar on both sides of the family so i guess i came with a stack deck and it was actually a substance which initiated my initial bipolar experience weed marijuana my dad struggled with this his whole life, as well as alcoholism, and it actually ended up costing him his life when I was 18. And what happened to me, I'd been smoking since I was 16, but when I was 22 in San Francisco, this time I tried to see spiritual layers to this, and it opened up this whole different dimension. I fell down Alice's rabbit hole, and there was a world where up was down and down was up. I was asking a caterpillar for directions, but he just said, who are you? which didn't really seem helpful at the time. Maybe it was. Long story short, it led to six involuntary psychiatric hospitalizations, two arrests, uh, blew $86,000, caused deep havoc in my relationships. But it was indeed a caterpillar story as I was dissolving the world that I knew to reemerge as something broader, something larger. Um, this butterfly that now finds new color in the world, and I get to use that lived experience in working with NAMI San Diego as a peer support specialist and with my own company, Inspired Mind Mental Health. So I'd like to share, firstly, what was it like when so-called psychosis dawned on me? Well, the Greeks have a word that's the opposite of amnesia, anamnesis. It's like waking up from a dream. It's like, oh, my word, I remember. Um, I was able to see the interconnection between all these different layers of reality, which always existed. It was like I was acting out every one of the Disney movies, and they were all this archetype that was working through my lived experience. Alice in Wonderland and Alice in the Quantum Land and The Matrix, all of these were waking up in my reality. So in section two, what I learned was the it wasn't a one-shot deal. I thought, all right, cool, I've woken up, I'm enlightened. I'm the next version of Jesus, which is kind of common within bipolar type 1. What I learned was that metamorphosis is a process, and metamorphosis sometimes involves a mess. 
And so what I discovered is if you're going to emerge into a higher dimension, which is what I believe these states of consciousness are, it's kind of a access to an unseen dimension that the neurodiverse, those of us who are wired slightly differently, can mediate between that dimension and this world. If we see it as kind of like a submarine popping out a lens from the ocean and looking at the, the world of the land reality, like aerial, I saw that my perspective, the lens was warped in certain places, and that was because of my vices or my little character defects. And so my view of the high dimension was warbled over there, which made me to stumble and not see the layout of the land very well. And so I learned that actually I have to let go of some of these things that had served me well previously in my life. And, but there's something better. There's, you know, as on, in the 12 step programs, the 12th step is as a result of the spiritual awakening, we take this message to others. Everyone's craving that little glimpse of heaven. I was craving that glimpse of heaven. And what I realized is I can have it in a pure sense. I can have the top, most top shelf stuff, but it would require cutting out certain things that were holding me back in my life. One of these things was the weed, was the substance. One of these things was my ego. And it's a work in progress, but it's a work that's happening. So now I'm able to reconstruct my worldview. It looks completely different. I've re-embraced the, the dynamism of the world and created my own models using my education. I got my bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of South Africa, and then my master's degree in theology, the study of God from Fuller Theological Seminary. And I'm now working with my peers to chart models of neurodiversity instead of disability. And I've created an encounter workshop that has neurodiversity gifts potential where we're able to access some of the gifts that these states of consciousness can provide if they're navigated well. And we don't always navigate it well. How do you learn to walk when you're born into this dimension? It's basically a series of coordinated falls, but you're falling forward. So that was, that's been my shifting understanding about how these states of consciousness work. And it's a work in progress, and it's a work that's enhanced by community, by you all, and gatherings like this, where something larger emerges than the sum of our parts. So uh, how about section number three? How did this label of bipolar, how did the interventions impact me, what both helped and hindered? Well, I don't really mind the, the word bipolar so much. Um, I think what it did actually was allow me to connect to other people who've experienced these kinds of things. It allowed me to qualify as a peer support specialist. And it literally opened up new possibilities that I never knew imagined before. But what was really debilitating was what they said bipolar was. Their whole biomedical reductionist materialist paradigm that said, sorry, man, you've got a lifelong disability. You've got mental illness. Wait, I'm sick in the head. But all these experiences were some of the most profound of my life. And I had a lot of evidence that I was onto something legit. My brother said that I was reading his mind verbatim. And I was able to tell two of my good buddies things that happened to them when they were little kids that they'd never told me before in a lot of detail. So I knew I was onto something. I think what the mental health field at the moment is doing is the best that it can with the biomedical model. We're taught in school that we're just random atoms bumping up against each other. There's no real meaning or purpose except maybe trying to squash the atom next to you. I think that we can move beyond that model into a more informed paradigm about the richness of meaning and purpose. And so I think that uh, although these kinds of understandings may be served us well in the past, there's something new that's emerging. And I believe the mental health field right here in this room can be the channel through which a larger societal shift emerges. So let's talk about the interventions that helped and hindered because I had a mixed bag. Um, I was blessed to connect to a therapist who really was willing to listen and collaborate. I had to shop around a little bit for a psychiatrist to find one who could collaboratively take direction as well as give direction. But once I found these group of people who were willing to engage in this kind of liminal space that exists between people, between conversations, it wasn't the one trying to fix a, de a defect in the other. It was both of them exploring this thing that's larger than both of us that's trying to emerge from us. So I managed to find that um, in, in my therapist. What I really managed to find that in was in the peer support community. I'm just enthralled by the peer support movement that's burgeoning at the moment. And in California, um, I just wrote the, the peer support certification examination. And I'm 
I really believe that we're on the forefront of something new and beautiful. I had to cut out the substances as I shared. And I think that we're going to have to learn how to navigate this intersection between substance-induced states of consciousness and so-called mental health diagnoses because psychedelics were originally called psychotomimetics because they mimic psychosis so closely. And Albert Hoffman, who invented LSD, sent it out to a bunch of psychiatrists because he knew it could give us insights into the state of madness. And yet, if we don't know how to navigate these higher dimensions, we're going to drown in them. So there's a psychedelic renaissance going on right now in America. Psilocybin, magic mushrooms, were just decriminalized in San Francisco the other day. And so people are going to be going into the state of so-called psychosis. And what they need is maps. What they need is water wings that allow them to swim. Because Joseph Campbell, the famous mythologist and comparative religion professor, said, the person in psychosis is drowning in the very same water in which the mystic swims with delight. So I believe here in the mental health community, we can give people maps and wings to be able to soar into this new space. So let's, let's wrap it up with a little section number five here. What could be the future of our movement, the, the future of mental health? Well, I believe that constructive critique of the existing models, that has its place for sure. And I believe that the majority of our energy should be put into constructing new models. They say, build the church and it'll come. And Einstein said we can't solve problems in the same mode of thinking that they were created in. And I think mainstream mental health is flailing because it only has the biomedical cosmology, the reductionist materialist worldview. What I think we need is a discovery of a new model of reality that we're multidimensional beings. And that like Viktor Frankl says, a person dies without meaning and purpose. And so I spoke yesterday in my presentation with Diana on a spectrum of mental health that relies on the saturation of empathy, which is energy, meaning, purpose, connection, and imagination. If we are able to access these kinds of dimensions again, wow, our world is going to glimmer and shimmer, and the mind's role in reality can really change it, because when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. I believe that those of us who are neurodiverse can be the canaries in the coal mines that signal it's time for greater societal metamorphosis in the direction of holistic wellness. And we can create new models that allow people to thrive, decentralized models. The mental health community could engage in Web3 technology, which allows for the integration of cryptocurrency and a decentralization of information and power so that we're not just kind of quickly given a, a Band-Aid in the hospitals and then sent on our way to try to thrive in a, in a capitalist society. We're creating our own society based on this multidimensionality. And so I think we can do this. I think that mental health could be the epicenter of a broader social awakening and that this is where, where it happens. It happens with our minds. I think we're in the land of opportunity in a time of opportunity. And so it's my dream to bring the depth and power of African origins into synergy with a culturally transformative capacity of America and position ourselves perfectly to ride this coming energetical wave which is going to be thrilling to ride, which is going to transport us all as a society to new places, and which is going to leave the sandbanks of the underlying terrain forever changed for coming generations. It's been an honor to partner and surf with you all today. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I'll, I'll love to be there next year. I'm flying to South Africa tomorrow, actually. And so thank you for involving me in this movement. It's real, a real honor to be a part of this beautiful, beautiful thing that's emerging. Thanks, Denise, and my fellow panelists. Whoop. Thank you so much, Josh. I think you're tapped in because you said a phrase that's been said twice this weekend, canaries in the coal mines. So you're tapped into us here. So we really appreciate you bringing synchronicity in. Um, the next person we have to present is a dear friend and colleague, Sandra Chang. She's a dear friend of mine from Los Angeles. She's a Taiwanese American artist, a peer mentor and website designer for the LA County Coalition, the Wildflowers Movement, and many other websites among her many artistic abilities. And I think we're going to play a PowerPoint first. Would you like to come up, Sandra? Hi, um, my name is Sandra. Um, and uh, 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 let's see, so I'm 
presenting on uh, uh, what helped, what harmed, uh, recommendations for the future. Um, and the first thing we'll be showing is a film that I created at USC called Pet on Tophilia. Um, and uh, this is my card. Thank you, Denise. Or, 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 what is your name? Jennifer, nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. You can undo with Control Z. In fact, you can have unlimited undoes in Photoshop by clicking the history tabs and drawing it. Undo manager, and you can go back to a scene. Thank you. Um, so this is for you. <laughs> uh, what is your name? Laura. Laura, thank you for being here, Laura. Um, so that is a film I created in 2002 um, when I went to USC for grad school. Um, that was about uh, hallucinations I had when I was obsessed with one of my art teachers in school when I was in Rutgers in New Jersey. Um, uh, he was my computer art teacher. And um, it was based on, I mean, the, the title, it could have been pedagophilia or pedag pedantophilia, you know, pe um, pedantic or pedagogy. Um, and this was a film that won a couple of awards uh, around the film circuits. Um, I also had a, a little bit of a retrospective at John Hopkins University for one year. Um, and uh, you can see a little, uh, th that's a slide of a, uh, my dad's an emergency room doctor, so I was able to get access to my um, CT records, and you can see like real quick um, shots of like my my skull, so that you can get that. You just can reference the um, kind of like a the butterfly sh shape of the skull to kind of make, make that reference of a butterfly to kind of um, make that schizophrenia reference. Um, because they think there were um, that study that maybe schizophrenia patients have like a butterfly shape um, hole in, um, in the brains. Um, uh, did somebody want to, what was your name? Excuse, sorry, what is your name? Tara. Tara. Thank you for being here, Tara. Um, so in, in um, I think it was year 2000, I had graduated. Uh, and what is your name, sir? Oh, 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 what is your name? I'm Bob. Bob, thank you for being here. Um, I was in uh, Vancouver General Hospital. I'm sorry, so what is your name? <laughs> Annie, thank you for being here. Um, uh, when I found out that I had schizophrenia, um, that was actually a relief to find out what I had. Um, it was free, free health care, and it was, you know, uh, the, the one thing that was kind of a shame was, you know, going, going to school there, um, I lost tuition, you know, because there's, it's one of those things. But, um, but, but at least the healthcare was free in. <laughs> so but whereas, you know, in another hospitalization, I lost the money uh, in, a, in the United States. Um, so I'm gonna pass this along. Would you mind passing this back? And um, <laughs> okay, so one of you two, what is your name? Len. Len. Thank you for being here, Len. And I guess you too, ma'am. 
Kathleen, thank you for being here. Okay, and I was at um, the ER. Um, my dad again is um, an emergency room doctor. Um, one of the things I say, and this really happened when I was in New Jersey, they put me in a straitjacket with the <laughs> little yellow flowers on it. And of course I imagined, you know, what, what do they do with the men? Like, are there patterns with <laughs> like Spider-Man or? <laughs> um, let's put this in, thank you. And is there anybody new who hasn't gotten one yet? And what is your name, ma'am? Pat, thank you for being here. Um, and so um, my, that's my cat Orinoco, and I've had her, I met her in New Jersey, and she stayed with me for about 18 years. She's been with me in Vancouver and California. And um, <laughs> so I, uh, uh, she, she helped me meet the love of my life. And um, and then I had therapy. Uh, I have a therapist who, who's basically been with me for 14 years, and and I, and um, the only therapist I've had actually. And I, I volunteer with a lot of groups, including the Wildflowers and LACCC, and um, I, I do all kinds of ther uh, therapy. Is there anybody who hasn't introduced themselves? Hi, what's your name? Thor. Thor. Oh, welcome. I've heard of your name before. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, what harmed? Um, so anybody want to pick one of these scenarios that they'd like to know more about? Oh, yeah. Um, I have a lot of pain issues, so um, one of the things I've been, you know, they, nobody knows how to help with TMJ, for instance. Acupuncture helps with that a little bit, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, how about you? Do you? Do you oh, okay. So. Okay. I need your card too then. <laughs> so what's your name? Penelope. Penelope. Nice to meet you. I, I'll, I'll have to find out. Yeah, I'm, I didn't know that. Do you think it helps with mental health? I heard about for anxiety. Uh-huh. I need to my child. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm oh, sorry. Okay, okay, good to know. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I guess we'll move on to the next card. Uh, next, uh, next. Oh yeah, did somebody want to choose one of these things that harmed? Yes. Uh, oh, okay. Um, so uh, the complex relationship I was thinking of in particular was with my father because um, he's a doctor. So, um, yeah, that, I guess it, it's hard to talk about that in general. Yeah. So, thank you. Um, did somebody just receive a card that hasn't said who they were? Yeah, Nicole, nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. Okay, and then um, uh, the person in the picture is in the room. Would you like to identify yourself? <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> He's my boyfriend, and he. And thank you for being here. Yes. Um, and then uh, the other, yeah, just making relationships, um, making sure that you you're you're keeping up with with classes and meeting new people, finding inspiration in new places, and wildflowers movement has definitely helped. Um, learning by doing things with patients helps. I'm gonna pass one more card. And uh, this is a tool that I was in part of um, NAMI Urban LA, and that I thought was one of the most helpful ones, especially being busy and not knowing what tasks to do next, just learning what is most urgent, what is most important. Um, and then who just received a card? Would you would like to introduce yourself? Michaeli, thank you for being here. Okay, and then, oh, God, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
<laughs> Any, yes, yeah, whatever you want to do. Hi, what would you, would you like to introduce yourself? Curtsy, nice to be here. I mean, nice to meet you. <laughs> um, so recommendations for the future of just a better communication system with the Social Security, Social Security Department, um, uh, anybody who has a diagnosis, anybody who has a payee, I feel like there's just a terrible system right now we have. Um, and uh, I feel like even and, and anything w w with regards to anybody who gets a diagnosis, um, or who anybody uh, the whole the whole psychiatric system feels like it's, there's there's something it's just hard to to get people to talk about it in general the whole the, the whole communication the system in general is kind of this just feels like there's something not quite there yet and um it would be nice to have a, a better base for us okay um and i want to thank you guys yeah Thank you so much, Sandra. It's such a pleasure to know you and to, to be a peer with you in Los Angeles. The next person I want to introduce is from my hometown, Portland, Oregon. Well, not my hometown, I was born there, but not my hometown, but her name is Laura Lee Scott, who's here to share as an awe entrepreneur and an award-winning writer and avid volunteer activist who enjoys providing inspirational author visits and workshops intended to help people to be the change they wish to see. Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, hold on. Oh, speak into it. Can't do this. Can't do this. Hello. All right, that's working. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura. It's really nice to be here with you. Um, this is my first time ever presenting at this kind of uh, conference. I am a children's book author primarily. I write. Uh, I have three children's books that are written under my own name, and then I also ghost write books for other people, and I also write memoirs. Um, and I've been a professional writer since 1991 when I graduated from college. Um, so this is like very much out of my <laughs> realm of expertise, but I am learning and growing, you know, all the time. I love hearing other people's perspectives and um, really consider myself a lifelong student. And so I'm really grateful to be here. So um, I basically just uh, introduced myself, but I did not mention that I'm also a former Lutheran married to a former Catholic. Um, I think that's kind of important. Uh, even as a very little girl, I always questioned things, not only of a spiritual nature, but also all sorts of societal norms that others seem more willing to accept. In June of 2007, after a number of very traumatic personal experiences that included physical health issues, severe chronic pain, relationship issues, and depression. I had, I, I, I'm gonna just pause and say that, um, this because this is pretty significant, I had eight months of complete bed rest between two pregnancies back to back um, after moving 2,000 miles away from my all of my family. So my husband had to quit his, dissertation, um, his PhD dissertation um, had to get a job on campus to get catastrophic insurance and our whole life trajectory completely changed because of my bed rest. Um, I will say that the reason uh, that I was able to carry my children full term was because of my incredible mind body connection. So while it was both um, kind of a curse, it, it was also a blessing uh, because I have fibromyalgia kind of pain and that cr chronic you know, nerve ending sensation all the time, but I'm also able to feel things, um, you know, like everything that's going on inside my body just incredibly strongly. So um, I just thought that was kind of worth pointing out, but uh, uh, at after experiencing these things for a while, I had been praying, I really had always strongly believed in a higher power. And I did call him God or her, actually they, 
as my journeys continued, I'm like, oh yeah, you are a they, okay. E equality, of course, why not? You know, of course you'd be an equalizer. But anyway, uh, I began to experience signs, dreams, visions, and physical sensations that were clearly otherworldly. In one dream, I found myself standing in an old church. Uh, someone that I intuited to be Jesus walked right up to me with a very big welcoming smile. After sizing me up, he cracked my back like a chiropractor and handed me a white robe and said, Laura, join my choir. It's worth noting that Jesus looked nothing like the socially accepted European version of him. He instead looked uh, exactly like Eddie Murphy. And I thought that was really awesome, frankly, because I, I really liked Eddie Murphy. And I also loved the fact that he was coming in um, as a person of color. I just thought that was cool. Um, and also probably true, true to life, of course. Um, to my mind, uh, let's see. I'm sorry, I'm a writer, so I, I really am not good at public speaking, so I need to read. Um, anyway, I turned and I saw during the stream a huge choir, and pretty much everyone that was in the choir, everyone was wearing white, ro white robes as well, and they uh, were all, almost all people of color, and maybe that was just because that was where my attention was drawn, but that made complete sense to me because of the horrific amount of oppression and the inequitable nature of our patriarchal and racist, you know, historically racist society. But I did wonder why the heck I was there, because um, I'm clearly a little white woman, um, and I was from suburbia and led, lived a pretty sheltered life. So that was something that I just kind of put in the, my back pocket as like a puzzle piece that I would try to hopefully get, um, find the answer to later. Uh, when I woke up from my dream, the very, debil very debilitating physical pain that I've been living with for many years was almost completely gone. I was able to stop taking all pain medications. In fact, that day, um, I went from really abusing uh, ibuprofen. Um, I was taking upwards of six to eight pills um, at a time just to manage the pain. Um, I suddenly needed none at all. And so I wasn't manic, I was just like experiencing real life without pain. And that was so different for me that it was something that I wanted to celebrate. This dream was only one of many that constituted the beginning of what would become a profoundly transformative spiritual awakening that I now recognize for myself, at least for my own journey, as a sanctification process. Um, it's, it does go by many different names, but it's a well-documented experience um, recorded throughout history. Although I've never he had never heard at that point in time the term spiritual awakening, and would not for a few few years to come, I intuited that that's what it was, and and I never wavered from this belief, even though it was a very murky experience that left me looking like I'd had a psychotic break. No one in my family believed in healings or in miracles of any kind, and if I hadn't experienced it myself, I probably wouldn't have either, frankly. When I told them what was happening to me, it caused great division in my primary relationships, and I don't really wanna go into it beyond that because frankly, um, I find all of this so divisive already. Um, yesterday, I was at a presentation in which a, a lawyer named Matt was there um, as an advocate for homeless, and he made this statement that um, the psychiatric um, establishment, as well as the hospital system, you know, and, and the process, the governmental process, and all these different systems that work together, just divide the crap out of families to the point where people who love each other dearly um, become advers adversaries. And I thought that was so true. And I spoke with my husband last night, and we have remained together through this whole experience, which is a miracle in and of itself. And and he said, I. I can't tell you how much I identify with that, that 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 you know really was something that brought us to the brink of destruction um, in our relationship. And we are fighting our way back. And I'm like physically, or not physically, I'm I'm tangibly watching an answer to prayer as we're led into a place of healing. Um, so anyway. I wanted to celebrate, but as I was making um, claims regarding spiritual experiences that no one else was having, it was extremely hard for anyone to believe. This lack of belief led to severe panic attacks, 
which caused me to enter the hospital system through the ER. My third trip to the hospital landed me on the psych ward. I was literally told by a, um, an ER uh, doctor who was extremely overworked, and I could sense that at the time, but he said that I'd already used up too much of the ER's valuable time and resources, and he just sent me straight up stairs. Um, and my husband, who was used to bed rest um, and hospitalizations with that, was like, this is gonna be awesome. You can watch movies. Actually, he said, we can watch movies. I'm like, have you not? Seriously not washed one flew over the cuckoo's nest? Like, this is not headed in that direction at all. Um, and it wasn't. So I just, um, you know, instead of being uh, able to be a young person who is truly spiritually parched and longing for a more authentic and meaningful connection and um, a meaningful existence, really, and connection with, with a God that I really truly believed in. Um, I was being told that I was so sick that I needed inpatient treatment, antipsychotics, and supervised visits with my children. This was incredibly traumatizing as I... Uh, as I was not a danger to myself. I was not a danger to myself or to others. I had no criminal record, nor did I have a history of abuse or addiction. I felt incredibly isolated, powerless, and horrifically misunderstood. Over time, I came to learn that I was on the path of a spiritual mystic mysticism, which is an intense solitary journey inward that goes by many names, sanctification, ascension, awakening, refinement, contemplation, purgation, purification, and others. However, at this point, I'd already been labeled mixed bipolar and had been told by psychiatrists that I would never be cured. Therefore, everything I did looked like a symptom of illness rather than a natural response that happens when one is shedding an old and equitable belief system along with all the cultural and religious indoctrination that goes along with it. No matter what medication I was forced to take or dutifully did take in an attempt to, approve, to prove my willingness to be compliant so that others would stop judging me so harshly Nothing kept me from continuing to experience all sorts of num num numinous signs and dreams and phenomenological experiences. In my mind, a quiet voice was constantly whispering spiritual awakening into my subconscious. Combined with that, as well as all the undeniable signs I'd experienced, there was simply no way I could just write off my whole experience as the misfiring of neurotransmitters or some kind of chemical imbalance. For a few months, I tried very, my very hardest to fight the darkness of indoctrinated mindsets and the marginalization, the marginalizing, stigmatizing nature of my psychotic, my psychiatric diagnosis. This mostly manifested at one point, um, as at this point, as relational issues, confusion, frustration, bitterness, and loneliness. I now understand that these are classic dark night of the soul experiences. Desperate to find help, or at least to simply be believed and not constantly told I was sick. I called churches of every denomination and requested to be put on prayer lists from all over the nation. I also kept a, de a detailed record through journal entries, photos, and videos of my experiences. Because no one in my family had ever heard of a spiritual awakening and everything I claimed was happening internally, the diagnosis of my bipolarity, given by very confident psychiatrists who were part of a whole se series of systems that seemed to work in tandem to discount and pathologize all spiritual experiences was difficult for them to question. This emotionally devastated me and sent my life spiraling in, a, in an entirely different direction that I felt helpless to control. Where I had once been a spiritual seeker who critically analyzed cultural indoctrination, where once I had turned to God in fervent prayer for healing and had felt answered to that prayer, where once I had felt God lifting the veil to allow me to experience a more authentic walk and connection with them, I now was re reduced to a biological problem child, nothing more than a patient in need of being closely monitored, medicated, and judged. Anything that happened that was negative in my family was now the fault of the one who was professionally diagnosed. 
trying to function as a normal mom, wife, and community member, I finally asked God to please remove the whole experience from me, at least enough so that I could continue to be a good mom to my two young sons, who were only about two and six at the time, and try to repair my marriage. I felt truly surrounded by darkness in a way I simply could not, could no longer fight. It was just pressing in from every angle. When I asked God to lift the spiritual energy from me, I immediately felt an energetic physical lift that reverberated through my entire body. And I knew I was being returned to a place that was akin to spiritual fog or basically cluelessness. Within that fog, I could finally be more present in this material world as a mom and a wife, a neighbor and a friend, but it meant not continuing to do the inner work that I felt called, so called to do. That said, I still had enough spiritual awareness to understand that something very significant and transformative had been put on hold. Many years rolled by. Finally, in 2015, I consciously asked God to allow me to continue on my spiritual journey. I felt my kids were old enough and autonomous enough to, if there is such a thing, to allow me to devote more time to my spiritual journey. From that moment on, it felt like the inner guidance, which I call Holy Spirit, was fast tracking me through an intense awakening or purification process. One night during a particularly painful and scary um, attack, which I truly, I'm going to say a word here that's not commonly said and is considered archaic, but demonic, that's what it felt like. Um, I saw a vision of Jesus and it changed my life. In that moment, I realized that Jesus was like the only one truly who would never hurt me. And although I had lost all of my, my religiosity, I lost like basically everything I believed in about the Bible. <laughs> like I just clung to Jesus and that was it. And, and to me, he had boiled, he had carved this path and boiled everything down to two things, like seek a higher power. Even if you're gonna, even if you're gonna seek that higher power, like with, fear and with hatred and with like anger like still seek it you know and uh and treat others you know uh, as you would hope they would treat you um just aspire to the golden rule okay so um while i have no problem admitting that i do fit the medical criteria of at least some of the bipolar label um i do feel it's a garbage pail label um I strongly believe that labels are incredibly stunting and debilitating strategies employed um, to cause a person to feel sick and set them into a, a trajectory that is um, the opposite of healing. It also causes one's loved ones to suffer trauma as well, which is something that brings an additional layer of guilt and shame and regret. I personally believe that one of the most important ways our world can heal, heal moving forward is to recognize the truth that we are all spiritual beings with a very temporary mind and body. We don't have to agree about any of the specifics of that at all. We, we're all it's a, we live in a diverse world for a reason. Just to know that we are all spiritual beings is a giant step forward in the right direction in my humble opinion. To, that, to this end, we must recognize and honor the truth that anyone going through mental anguish needs to receive at least as much spiritual nourishment and support as any other kind of medical intervention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. We're going to move on so we can have some time for Q&A. And the reason I brought the the attention back to the um, podium earlier was because the people online cannot hear anybody without a microphone. So that's going to be at the end. Um, our next speaker is Jennifer Hanley. She's a psychiatric doctor of nursing practice with over 20 years of treatment experience in various populations. She's currently working with a first psychotic episode program in Virginia. In Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. It's really great to be here, you guys. Um, I wonder how many in this room have lived experience, if you're willing to identify yourself. I really think you deserve a round of applause for being here and for what you've done for I don't have a computer. I'm working off notes, so forgive me for that. So a few years ago, um, in my 40s, if you looked at it from the outside, I had a pretty good life. I had a really busy practice. 
um, outpatient psychiatric practice. I was married, son, um, thought everything was going okay. Apparently I compartmentalized very well. Uh, and at some point I started hearing a voice and the voice was really supportive uh, at first. And then that morphed into many, many voices, um, scary ones, devils, saints, um, telling me things like a patient was following me. I even went to the sheriff's office at one point because I thought I was being followed and targeted. Um, at one point it said my husband was trying to kill me and was planning to. Um, just a lot of scary stuff. Despite all this, this continued for about two years. I didn't tell anybody. I think I'm very good at walking the walk, unfortunately, and um, trying to keep it together on the outside. I went through periods of prayer, going to Catholic church, I was raised Catholic, so all that guilt. and. Uh, Praying, praying my, my tail off till my knees hurt, um, begging to have whatever this was go away, um, and sometimes just pulling my hair out because I was just at the end of my rope. Um, I would feel myself being hit by what I thought was a demon, like hit off the back of the head, pushed. Um, I would smell burning flesh um, and just hear lots of very, very scary things and, and see things that were very scary. Through this time, I still somehow uh, continue to see patients. I remember once on my lunch break, I got in my car and drove around and the voices were so <laughs> intense that I would even play games with them. For instance, I knew they didn't want me to die. Um, I didn't know that. And I said, okay, I lived in North Carolina. The next birch tree, I see I'm going to run into because I had never seen a birch tree <laughs> where I live. Voices didn't seem to know this. <laughs> and uh, they said, no, 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 don't do that. Do that. And then they were quiet for a little while. So it actually worked um, for a little bit. Yeah, you come up with anything you can to try and deal with things. Uh, it's amazing what your, main, what your mind comes up with. Well, eventually I did land in a hospital uh, one night um, I had some marital issues at the time that I didn't know how to work through, and I honestly didn't know what to do. Tried everything under my tool belt to try and figure out and couldn't, and I really think the voice started as a way to help support me and guide me a little, and when I didn't get it, um, it flourished, and I took everything they said literally. I now know that those voices were trying to support me and warn me um, and were speaking metaphorically, and that's my interpretation. Uh, anyway, I ended up in the, in the ER after following a dog around because everything was going to electrocute me, but the dog knew where it was safe. So I was going where the dog was on the floor, scaring the heck out of everybody because they thought I was killing the dog. Ended up in the ER. Um, was terrified of my husband, so he couldn't come in. And some things that didn't work, they said a social worker would come talk to me. So they dragged me into the ER, and I was terrified to go in the room because I knew it would electrocute me. So I stood right on the, right on the entrance for hours, very uncomfortable, trying to stand on one foot. Um, all I wanted really was for someone to just come talk to me. So if anybody had said, what's going on? Why don't you feel safe? I would have been able to go in that room. Nobody did. I could hear them talking, the nurses <laughs> a comment here and there about, yeah, I thought she was okay at first, but there's obviously something wrong with her. Look at the weird positions she's standing in, that sort of thing. Um, at one point, uh, the voices said, okay, you can move. So I backed up and then I tried to get out. And that's when I was grabbed by two male nurses, dragged, kicking and screaming. I thought they were going to kill me. And the voices were telling me, see, I told you this is what was going to happen, and now you're going back to hell. They held me down on the bed, um, and they gave me what we used to call in the business, and probably still do, vitamin H, or Haldol. Um, I thought that was poison, so I thought they were killing me, and when they put that in me, um, that's when I gave up. Kind of floated out of my body a little bit because I thought I was going to die, and that was the end. It wasn't, thank God. The next day, my parents had flown in 
and they decided to move me to an inpatient facility. This was in New Hampshire, and um, they shackled me up before they took me out to the car. My father was a cop, retired, so that was very hard on me because I knew I didn't do anything wrong. And it was pretty humiliating to have to walk in shackles outside and have them follow me into that car. Lucky for me, the hospital was not an altogether horrible experience. One nurse in particular, one night brought in nail polish from home and did our nails. And that was probably the only time I felt human uh, when I was in the hospital and still to this day, very grateful to her. At one point, a male nurse told me, um, these voices are probably never going to go away. This is something that you're going to have to get used to. And I just cried and cried because here I had all of this education behind me, this practice, people relying on me, my family. And he was telling me that I was incurable. And I thought, this doesn't make sense. I'm in my 40s. This doesn't hit in, in your 40s. This has to be, you know, th there has to be a cure. So I did what I always do, and I look at the literature. <laughs> and uh, I didn't find my answers there, though I was given many diagnoses after that. Major depressive disorder with psychosis, dissociative identity disorder, schizoaffective disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, I'm probably forgetting a few. None of them explained everything that was happening with me. Um, I was lucky enough to stumble upon a psychologist that specialized in psychosis when I was released after about a month from the hospital, still hearing voices on Risperdal, gained 20 pounds, um, couldn't really feel much, pretty masked. And uh, it took about a year for me to come to grips with what had happened, that this was actually very traumatic um, experience and I had a lot of trauma going in my life that I was compartmentalizing and, and just didn't want to see. Um, some things that helped me tremendously was the psychologist just letting me tell my story. Um, there was a book, I don't know if it's still available by, I think um, it was called Working with Voices 2 that's still available. I really highly recommend it. It's kind of like a workbook and it helped me to kind of draw the people that I heard and define them. And after about a year, my psychologist gave it back to me and it really, really helped me to understand where I was and how far I had come. Um, things started to get better. I went back to work for some time. That was very, very difficult. A lot of, a lot of pushback from the psychiatric and psychologic, um, psychological community uh, that I didn't expect. It was really, really rough. I had been stigmatized as somebody who was ill and possibly dangerous to patients. Um, I was being told in my own clinic that I needed a doctor's note in order to see my patients again. Um, and that was probably the least. Of, of what happened there. Uh, at this point, a couple of years later, I'm still in therapy, thank God, same psychologist, um, went through a separation and that was um, something that kind of turned things on. I mean, during all of this, the voices really did quiet down. I am grateful for the initial Risperdal because it at least got rid of some of the terror. Um, and I was able to wean myself off of it. One of the most helpful things my psychologist said was, don't tell your psychiatrist that you're still hearing voices because she's just going to up your meds. And um, so I didn't, and I was able to come off of it completely. And the voices quieted and I worked with them. Something else that was helpful for me was making time um, for the voices, you know, if I was at the gym and they were really bothering me, I would say, okay, I promise at two o'clock I'll give you 30 minutes and you can talk to me as much as you want. And that actually worked. Um, believe it or not, uh, today I am not on um, any antipsychotic meds. I am on a couple of antidepressants and that sort of thing that are really helpful. But therapy has been the most helpful thing for me. Um, I think the stigma of being in that sick role kept me there for a long time. I didn't feel like I was good enough. Um, I, didn't I didn't have the confidence in myself to practice. 
for a while. Um, I ended up teaching for a couple of years before I went back into patient care. And somehow um, I fell into a position working with a first episode psychosis program where there is a person with lived experience in every visit that I'm, that I'm in with patients. And I just find that amazing. I wish I had something like that when I had gone through this. Um, I tried to make this as hopefully helpful as possible to people to try and understand what it's like to go through something like this and how hard the psychiatric system can be. Um, I remember even saying to the nurses, my symptoms are here, my symptoms are talking, things like that, because I knew the lingo. I knew what they wanted to hear. They wanted me to think it was symptoms, even though I didn't believe that at the time. I thought they were entities. Um, so, so I knew the lingo to try and get myself out of a hospital. <laughs> um, to this day, I still hear voices, whispers, a word here and there, but I pay attention to them. I know, at least I feel, they're parts of me that are trying to protect me, and I pay attention. Um, and I give them the voice that they need. I also continue to go to therapy, and I find that really helpful. I don't talk about what I went through to people in my profession um, because I know it isn't safe to do so. It is in this room, and thank you for that. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, we do have some time for questions. In the chat, we have a lot of comments, a lot of positive comments, and people asking for emails and resources. And I ask the people in the chat to just reach out to the speakers for emails and resources. So um, we do have time for questions. If anybody wants to raise their hand, and I'll pass around the mic, or Claire will. Hi there, my name is Chelsea. Um, I really wanted to thank everyone who shared their story. Um, I think it's such a beautiful um, like honor for us and I really, I really mean that. It's an honor to be able to hear what you've gone through and, and just to kind of be able to share in, in your description. Um, and I really um, I feel very lucky that it is a piece of, of our meetings so I really want to thank you so much. And I, I noticed just so much compassion. I have such appreciation also of how each of us finds our own way through life and no matter what other people are kind of telling us. And I, I am really so glad to hear each of you, you know, finding pieces of what is you instead of feeling like we have to become or conform to something that we're told. So just so much appreciation and compassion. Thank you. Hey, uh, shout out to my brother Josh over there. <laughs> oh, Rick. Oh, Rick. I brother actually have Rick. a question for Jennifer, which is um, if you feel comfortable, um, and if you don't, that's fine. But um, if, you'll, if you feel comfortable, did you want to talk about um, what you've learned about maybe who your voices are and where that came from and get a little more in depth? I can try. I don't have all the answers, and I haven't figured it all out yet, to be sure. Um, I know some of the voices came from past trauma, and those are things that I'm just now beginning to scratch the surface on in therapy, um, trying not to dissociate the whole time <laughs> when I do so. Um, and I know some are, are voices that I had in my past that um, these voices that we internalize about ourselves uh, from things that people have said to us over the years or experiences that have happened that we believe erroneously. 
Um, now, uh, one of the things that I feel instead of the voices is I feel a tap on my head a lot. And that used to scare the heck out of me, but now I think of it as it's okay. <laughs> it's okay, you're gonna be fine. So that's how I decided to interpret that. Um, I think that's about where I am right now, if that helps. I'd like to thank each of the speakers and to note that each there is so much resonance in each of your stories, um, your experiences with my own experience. And the fact that um, I got my start as a mental health advocate and edu educator through NAMI. And I like to say that NAMI gave me my voice and the Hearing Voices Network set me free because I now under, I never accepted my diagnoses, you know, the official ones being um, major depression with psychotic features, schizophreniform disorder, bipolar disorder. And then based on the array of experiences that I described in my memoir, hearing voices living fully, schizoaffective disorder, but I had a professional career. And, and I, the understandings that I have derived pr um, primarily, I think, through ISPS, um, and the ways in which I have been encouraged to explore the array of traumas that I had, which were never abuse, but um, historical and familial trauma, mild racism in the United States, and various other things. But, um, and being able to make sense. And, you know, um, Jennifer, um, you're, there's so much resonance with your story in particular. And um, I, I so appreciate the um, the discernment and and care with which that you each of you has used and the care with which you've described your experiences. Thank you. So we have a couple questions from the chat, and if anybody else has any questions from the room, just raise your hand. Um, are there any resources for where is where did that question go? Are there any resources? for uh, ways the psychiatric system divides families. And I, this is not a personal question for the panel, but maybe it's for everybody here, and maybe it is for the panel. I guess it's a reflection from Laura's. I wish that there were more supportive groups available. I sought a group when I got out of the hospital and I couldn't find one anywhere in uh, North Carolina, we're not exactly progressive. Um, I did go to uh, DBSA, which is a depression bipolar support group, and that was pretty helpful, and they tend to be pretty much across the country. Um, I tried to go to NAMI because I had actually volunteered for them before and spoke for them before. Um, for some people, that's helpful. That wasn't helpful for me. I do wish that there were more family-centered groups available. Okay, we have some questions on this side. Or, and this. Um, this question is also for Jennifer. <laughs> I feel really curious how um, your experience maybe changed the way that you interact with your patients or in your practice, and I wonder if you'd be willing to speak more on that. Um, yeah, I always thought of myself as a prescriber that was very empathic, empathetic, caring, all of that good stuff, but I did not get it until I went through this. I did not. I do now. I understand the terror that goes along with it. I understand the absolute horror that it entails in the feeling of isolation that it brings with it. So yes, it has changed the way I work with people very much. Um, I ask about what they're experiencing. I let them tell their stories. I do not judge. I do not push anything on them that says they're wrong about anything, because they're not. It's their experience. It's their reality. So it has changed the way I practice. It 
to her. Thank you. Um, I, I was very touched by all of your, your experience that you've shared today on the panel. Um, one thing I heard was, um, as somebody in a mental health profession, it's it's often something you feel like you have to hide or you can't talk about among your colleagues. And I've heard that a lot, that there's, I've heard um, a psychiatrist in my own community who had been working alongside me for a long time and then finally felt comfortable enough to share her own lived experience. Um, I wonder if there's anything you would say to someone else working in a therapy or, or, or um, therapist or other sort of counseling role of like how to overcome that, that kind of stigma and and how to address that like how to share your experience as a profession in the mental health field who, who is this for sorry is this for josh or anyone okay josh oh well yes please well thank you yeah i think that the barriers that society puts up to being authentic um, are one of the things that stops us from being as effective as we can be um, so I was working within psychology a little bit before my bipolar diagnosis, um, but then getting a role as a peer support specialist, where I literally got the job because of my diagnosis, that allowed me to shed all sorts of layers. And I recognized within the office already, everyone knew about these states of mind and all the deep meaning in them, but everyone would only talk about them in private and never in group settings. Um, so I tried my best to be the change that I wanted to see. And I was just an, an open book and I, I spoke about it everywhere. And it's ironically led to this unfolding within my own life. I think that we're moving beyond having to kind of wear white coats and be the professional. And I think that lived experience is the power. Carl Jung says that uh, we can only be effective if we are affected. If we wear our white coat and like a shield of armor, then we prevent the deep healing that we can. So I know it's hard to navigate. Um, I would recommend finding safe people to be able to share it with initially. And then once there's a few of you, you can really start to change the atmosphere of that environment. But it's an awesome question. Thanks. Okay, this will have to be the last question because we're at time for lunch. Sure, sure. Actually, um, I wanted to share some resources for family. Thank you. Um, so one is called Healing Families Together. Krista McKinnon, uh, that's online. She's in California, if she still is. I haven't talked to her in a while. Another one is <clears throat> HVN for Friends and Family. And there's uh, Monday evening and late Thursday afternoon. Actually, in the Bay Area, if they live around here, there are in-person ones. Um, and I think if you go to HVN-US, Hopefully they're still listed on there. Um, and the third thing was, <laughs> drum roll, my brain. Um, meanwhile, while that comes back to me, I wanted to <clears throat> just tell you how, um, I'm just sitting here going, oh, this is so cool, that people, you know, that you are able to share your experiences on, in a way that, you know, like other people have said, that we can really understand. Um, I come from a family of voice hearers, extreme states, and whatnot, including my son. And I'm, I'm just feeling so like, oh gosh, yes, this can happen. I mean, it's it's taken a long time for people to be more open about that. And um, okay, what's the other one? Okay, I have to think about it. Um, there's HVN for friends and family. That's actually um, came out of Wildflower Alliance out in Massachusetts. And then uh, Healing Families Together is like a six week program. Okay. Before Thank we you. end, uh, may I? I don't want to. Um, I would like to, the Hearing Voices Network USA, which began the um, HVN for friends and family also offers many support groups, both in person and online. If you go to Hearing Voices Network, I think it's Hearing Voices Network USA or Hearing Voices USA, and, um, and we can provide that information. There are online support groups in person. Connecticut Hearing Voices Network also offers online and in-person groups. And I have folks um, who have joined from certainly um, the tri-state area, New York, um, Connecticut, Massachusetts, but also around the country.